Hey, Scott from Aristocob.com here. And Seth from Woodwishes.com. Together, along with you, the three of us, we are Mark Woodman's Breakfast Club. Welcome back once again. And good morning, boy. How you doing? Oh, I'm doing all right. How are you? I'm doing well. You're sounding a little sniffly. What's, uh -huh. what's up with that? I um. So it is uh, evening time at this point, uh, time of recording. I made it into work and made it about half an hour before I, I was kicked out of the office um, and uh, came home and, and took a long nap. Uh, over the weekend, I uh, caught a cold. Several in my household had a cold and uh, it seems to have hit me the worst. And so I um, am sniffly, but thankfully no fever, nothing else. Certainly not COVID. It's definitely just a snot, a snot face. Good. Well, if you uh, if you turn it, tune into the video that I posted today on uh, my growth rings, mm -hmm. I had no idea until the comments started coming in how bad I was sniffling. And I knew that my nose was runny. I knew I was wiping my nose. I edited out a few nose wipes, but it's awful. It is so mm -hmm. awful. And so I'm, I'm with you. I mean, besides the fact that my nose was running, I went from inside the house to the garage and the garage was super cold yesterday. Yeah, and that that just told my body eject all all mucus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I, I took um, uh, I took some uh, melatonin last night to help me sleep. Um, so I was in bed much earlier than normal, um, but it uh, had the the effect of of when I woke up, I was feeling groggy, um, and then in the morning I took some Advil, cold and sinus. Um, to help with my sinus congestion and then drank um, a, a boatload of caffeine like normal. And uh, within an hour, I was like tweaking. I, I, I was feeling the effects of whatever the various drugs were and how they were interacting in my system. Um, you know, I don't expect at that point the melatonin was there. I think it was just physiologically, my, my brain, I felt super cloudy, um, a little shaky, and on top of that, um, congested. And so like I said, it it was about half an hour into the workday that um, the first time I saw my boss, I said, hey, I might go home. I don't ever do that. Um, didn't want to just call in, but I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to be productive today. I can already tell it. <laughs> I hate that, too, when you're congested and your nose is running. Uh -huh. It's like, can we choose one thing or another, uh -huh. please? <laughs> yeah. So I went out and got some... Um, uh, I've used the uh, Vicks nasal spray in the past to great effect mm -hmm. and um, found uh, Walmart now has a brand that's like a third the price and works super well. Just as effective. Eucalyptus. Eucalyptus. Yeah, it's, eucalyptus. it's like it shoots menthol straight up into your nose hair. It's mm -hmm. very bizarre, um, but incredibly effective. I mean, this is this is the, the most congested I have been. I'm not even congested, just a little sniffly um, all day. And I'm about an hour away from from my uh, my next dose of that. So you just need to keep a little container of wasabi on hand. Yes. That that'll uh, <laughs> the snort or whichever. <laughs> yeah, you can yeah. get it in the dry form and just snort it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I had a had a, a coworker when I was younger um, who did that one day. It no. was a bad yeah. Yeah, it was a dare, and it was a bad decision, a bad life choice. They, they deserved it. <laughs> oh, yeah, for sure. For sure. They said oh yes gosh. to the dare. So. Okay, so um, you you weren't feel, feeling well. I spent the entire day in training and, and felt kind of talked out when we last chatted, and uh, we talked about do we want to go to the shop and get the fire going, and it's like, you know what? No, let's just let's just do this, and so here we are. So this weekend, I did something fun. I, I'd, I'd love to know what you did, but I'm going to go first because I had a really great weekend. Um, I told you. I yeah. Spent a well, snot in my face. <laughs> took, uh, took Friday off and uh, Jandy and I, yo mom, Joe Mama, and I um, took off and went over to, what town were we in? Well, we were just outside of Fuquay. Um. Mm -hmm. If you know Fuquay, which is not I too do. far from, from Fuquay Blues. Fuquay Barina. Yes, Fuquay Barina. Um, and uh, we we used up some of our Hilton points at a Hampton Inn and just traveled around that end of, of the country where we've not spent a whole lot of time. 
And um, one of the things that I've wanted to do ever since we moved here in 1999 is we went to the Tobacco Farm Life Museum. So I sent you a cool. picture. I don't know if you can pull it up. Yeah. Um, Give me and that's, that's simply a picture of moi in front of the sign. Um, it totally different than what I expected to find there. I, I'd always envisioned that uh, it was a place that, that had tobacco planted. So this time of year, there would be no tobacco planted. Maybe there would be a tobacco barn with some tobacco hanging in it and so on. I didn't expect it to have a, it would be a full on museum and it wasn't just tobacco farm life. It was farm life in North Carolina, but primarily centered around the tobacco industry. And uh, so they had some cool old, old antique uh, tractors farm implements of all sorts, um, some conveyances, you know, some wagons and things like that. They had an area set up of, a, of what it was like to go see your local doc doctor back in those days, which was kind of scary looking. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, um, they, they ran a video of explaining how tobacco auctions work, which right. was fascinating how they do these, I mean, just breakneck speeds. And as the as the auctioneer, they're walking down these aisles with the bales of uh, tobacco in front of them, and and they're just they're walking, 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 walking the whole time. The the uh, uh, the auctioneer is just calling, and the guys in a line, the buyers are in a line, and based on how much tobacco they're going to purchase determines where they are in that line. So the guys from RJR and uh, you know some of the big cigarette companies would be at the front of the line. And they're just constantly buying and they use just these hand signals and they'll use they'll use three fingers up to mean they want to go up three dollars they'll go three or two fingers down to mean that their bid is two dollars below what is currently the high bid or what the auctioneer is saying and you just see these guys walking and fingering up and down and doing these mm. it, it looks like they're calling plays into third third base or something and all the while, the uh, the guy behind the auctioneer is just writing on these cards and throwing them down, right on this card, throw them down, right on the cards. And they uh, they asked him to explain what he was writing. And basically, in that quick little jot, he was writing which lot, who bought it, and the price they were they were paying. And faster than I could have written those three things, they're onto the next card, onto the next mm. card, onto the next card. Just rows and rows of of these uh, bales of tobacco. It was really fascinating. And of course, I thought about us going through Sutliff and yep. uh, and seeing all those bales of tobacco and how interesting that was. Yeah, um, but uh, that was cool. We um, we then were, were uh, I, I, how many I people sure were there for that uh, at, at the museum? Well, I mean, so the the auction. Oh, it was a video about the auction. Yeah, so a when video was, of when an auction. The auction had been. Oh, that auction probably took place 20 years ago. So on the auctioneer side, there were three people. And on the buying side, there were six or seven people. But they, they okay. were saying that, that those there were multiple auction houses. The auctions uh, happen a couple of times a year, but ongoing at these auction houses. And that, that basically there are two times a year that crops are brought in for auction, okay. um, depending upon whether uh, if I recall, whether they are air cured tobaccos or flu cured tobaccos mm. would determine when they bring their tobacco in for auction. So you bring them in fresh. Well, no, they, bring they bring them in, in after. It's brought in, it's brought in dry. It's brought in dry either way. But one case it's hung in a barn and just left, left to naturally air dry or, or we, right. the modern, modern dryers, they look like containers and they, they load the tobacco in there. And then basically they're like, like kilns or humidors that are bringing the temperature and the humidity to just the, the proper ideal situation. So they're not counting on these open air barns like they used to. Right. Um, anyway, that, it, was, it was interesting to see. And then there was a lot more than I thought indoors and then outdoors, they've relocated a number of buildings, a farmhouse, a barn, a tobacco barn, um, uh, a, a shop, that had some some wood and some metal machining stuff going on. I can imagine that in the summertime, there's probably a blacksmith in there working away and probably a woodworker doing some stuff and probably a cook in the house making things. 
So we'll we'll have to go back when there's some some activity there. So was it was um, it like a Colonial Williamsburg or Jamestown where it's uh, like it was, a living museum kind of thing? Or well, I don't know. I I I, I assume that it is. Call it during season, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, what I do know is we were the only guests that I saw there. Mm. And uh, there, there were two people there, um, uh, a lady running the place and her young daughter who was being homeschooled there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, so it was, it was pretty quiet. Oh, I did buy something. Uh, let, me, let me go get it. So talk for a okay. moment. I'm gonna, I've got my earbuds in, so I'll be able to hear you. So watch what you say. Yeah, you'll be able to talk too. That's true. So watch, watch what you say. Which probably means your mom's going to start talking as I walk through here. How how many times uh, have oh, you yeah. or your coworkers um, walked away but forgot to mute yourself and uh, wind up in the bathroom, and so you and everyone else just here peeing? I um, I don't think so. Has that never but, happened? It never happened to you or your coworkers? Um, it's You've never, never been on the receiving end of that on either side. No. Oh. oh. That's happened. That's happened before, where uh, middle of a meeting, someone gets up, forgets to mute themselves, and you hear them in the bathroom. Oh, I just, I just found two things I want. Okay. Okay. This is uh, a good trip. This was a good trip in. Let me tell you. So, um, I feel like, I feel like, uh, if you've been on YouTube at all the last couple of weeks, um, it, it really would not be a YouTube video of the last, uh, say, two weeks, um, if we didn't talk about GameStop. And oh, Wall God. Street bets, because okay, there's so, not been a single YouTube video made over the last two weeks that didn't talk about GameStop or Wall Street. Bets. Okay, we will we will talk about that. But let me let me show you a couple of my souvenirs from the uh, the tobacco place. All right, so check this out. Do you have um, any uh, wrist cobs? I, I got uh, decals of, of nice. tobacco leaves. Okay. Um, I got a couple decals of the, the sign. Mm -hmm. I got packages, a couple packages of tobacco seeds. Yeah. And I saw those and I thought, okay, tobacco seeds are much smaller than that. And why are those pink? So I asked Lee, I said, why are these pink? She said, because they're covered in clay. They encapsulate them in clay oh. so that they can meter them out. So, because, you know, that they're so small. It would be easy to accidentally plant three three seeds in one spot, right? And they they plant these in in peat peat planters, uh -huh. and and they plant them uh, in the late winter in hot houses or greenhouses, and then that way they can transplant plants into the ground. They have a better chance of surviving than if you just plant seeds. So then, do they plant them clay and all, and and the clay just yeah. The clay just dissolves. water and it mm -hmm. dissolves. Oh, huh, that's smart. Yep. But here's my favorite thing. I'm hoping you can see it. Um, I bought a tumbler. Oh, and tobacco leaf. It is a it is resin? several to, several tobacco leaves in resin. Nice. I thought initially because you've seen the ones where basically you unscrew it and it's hollow and they uh -huh. stick something down that's inside sticker. of it. But this is a, a are genuine tobacco leaves that are set into resin. It's just that's cool, beautiful, and crazy cool. expensive. Otherwise, we would both have one right now. Yeah, that sounds <laughs> right. That's um, super neat. I had no idea how much it was when I grabbed this one. I looked; they had a couple of them on the shelf, and I said, "Oh, this one's gorgeous." I looked at Jandy. I said, "I'm buying this." So how much was it? And uh, sixty-five dollars, fifty-nine dollars. What a deal! What a bargain! Nine dollars. However, made in North Carolina genuine uh, -huh. uh you know talk about cottage industry mm -hmm. <laughs> we were talking about cottage industry last week right. um and you know when's the next time i'm gonna get back there it's no time soon yeah well i mean except uh, when it's tobacco season and, and the grandkids and the museums in full, full swing that's cool so nice, as we were nice a couple of day trip as we were outside of the place, um, your mom thought to check to see if they had any geocaches, and they did. So we went looking mm -hmm. for the caches. And um, while while we were out there, I noticed that they had something of a windmill. It wasn't exactly a windmill. It was more of a kinetic art art piece. 
and uh, I didn't send you this picture. So let me see if I can find you that didn't. picture real quick. Send it to me. Um, well, actually, I got a, I got a video of it, but here, let's see a picture. So I don't see myself. Let me let me bring myself back into view. Uh, yeah, you're fine. Picture's good. Okay, so you can see the tail of that windmill is a tobacco leaf. It was stuck in the tree nearby. Mm -hmm. So the, the thing wasn't facing the wind. And then the big blade was spinning a little bit, but more importantly, the little propellers that are all around that big blade were going to town. Oh, wow, that's cool. And it, was, and it was making a racket. And um, so I took some video and shot some pictures of it. Well, we, we leave this place, we drive about a mile down the road, there's this cool little old town. So I, I turn to go down to that town and your mom says, home of the whirly gig. And we Google it real quick and find out that sure enough, some guy from that town was famous for making whirly gigs. And, I, and she was asking me what a whirly gig was. It's, you know, like the folk art things, you know, my, the, the one I grew up seeing in a neighbor's house was it had a guy that was chopping wood with an ax and another one where the guys were sawing. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then we Googled it and saw that there is in a nearby town a whirly gig park. Got to go see the whirly gig park, right? So if you have that picture. Yeah, it's a terrible picture in low light, but I've got because it. Because the, the sun was going down. Gotcha. And um, what what this is, is those the, the biggest whirly gig there is 40 tons and it's 50 feet in the air. So these wow. are huge monstrous whirly gigs and this guy whose name was something uh, uh has an odd name um starts with a v um simpson and uh he was that guy that was the local the local guy simpson does and, not start with um, a v Vol Volus simpson and this was the Volus simpson whirly gig park there's actually a big museum there where they are um, reconditioning these old whirly gigs that he built. They were all on his own property. However, he he sold these things all over the world. There's one in Japan. There's one in Russia. And he's a, a noted um, American um, folk artist. So the town has the biggest collection of, of Wallace Simpson whirly gigs. That's cool. Well, we were there during the daytime, and one of the things we saw, we saw a North Carolina um, tourism video on him, and they said that one of the things he did, it was all found material. He worked in the construction trade and would get these big things that he collected old city and state signs, so like stop signs and road closure signs that are very reflective. And then he cut those up and had these reflectors on everything that, that these whirly gigs are lit up at night and it's supposed to be a kaleidoscope of colors. So we spent the next three hours wasting our evening kind of around the area just so we could go back <laughs> and see it at night. Their idea of a kaleidoscope of colors and my idea of a kaleidoscope are too altogether different. Oh, uh, no. Yeah. Too much hype. Yeah. So then, then we went to dinner. And uh, we, we pull up to this Chinese buffet because it was there, we saw it. And I open up Yelp and see that it has like one and a half stars and was, no, we're not going in here. So I sorted based on reviews and uh, the highest rated restaurant was a place called um, the Beef Master Inn. So without reading any reviews, four and a half stars with like 500 reviews, we went to the Beef Master Inn. We get there, there are three old guys standing at the front door as we, it's just a small place, really, mm. really small. Um, but the parking lot was pretty full. Three old dudes standing at the door. So as I walk up to the door, they are turning around and leaving. And I said, so what's the word? And one of the guys says, 15 minute wake, we're head, wait, we're heading to Burger King. I'm like, if, this isn't worth a 15 minute wait and Burger King is the, uh, maybe mm -hmm. this isn't, but no, it was rated too high. It has to be decent. So we check in, the guy says, 15 minutes, please wait in your car, we'll come get you. So we waited in the car and he came in and got us. Um, 
we sit down and I immediately said to Jane, I need to hit the restroom. So I'll be right back. Go to the restroom. I come back out and there's a guy at our table with a butcher board that, and on it is a ribeye, a whole ribeye loin. So basically like a standing rib roast without the ribs. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, well, your mom must have said he's going to want ribeye because they brought this beautiful ribeye out. And mm -hmm. the guy kind of, la he lays his knife on it, kind of indicating, okay, there's about this much is extended beyond the knife. He says, we begin at eight ounces and go from there. And it's looking at Jandy. And she says, um, I'll take six ounces. And he looks at her and he says, we begin at eight ounces and go from there. <laughs> kind of offering a little correction. Yeah. I guess I'll, I'll go eight ounces. He asked her how she wants it cooked. He asked me how much I want. Of course, I want more. Mm -hmm. <laughs> go 12 ounces. He cut a very generous 12 ounce and uh, asked me how I wanted to cook. And then he's gone. And, and we're looking at each other like, what, what just happened? I said, did you tell him that we wanted ribeye? She says, no, we just showed up at the table with that. Mm. Okay. There's a butter dish on the table with a full brand new stick of butter and, and not much else. And your mom had already ordered drinks. She ordered me a, a, a Diet Coke, and then out comes a, a 20 ounce plastic bottle of Diet Coke and a cup of ice. Oh, so that's how we roll. We're gonna get a, mm -hmm. a bottle drink. And we noticed as we walked in, there was this very small salad bar, um, you know, maybe two feet deep and four feet long. And then this big glass punch bowl that had salad in it. And I, and I said, does the salad come with this? She says, I don't have any idea how this works. Not people that no ask about we, salad is how they know you got yeah. the Burger King. Sorry, <laughs> no sooner had we said said that that this the guy walks over and drops two bowls on our our table. Oh, I guess we get salad. So uh, we we get up and go to the salad bar and and we get to this giant clear you know like um, glass punch bowl. It's filled with ice. In the middle of that is another punch bowl that's filled with lettuce and slices of tomato cascaded all the way around and those tomatoes you know when you get that blt that is just perfect it's that heirloom tomato that was vine ripened and that mm -hmm. all the way around these tomatoes just look mm -hmm. amazing and then and then around the outside of that were these glass containers that had uh, various cold toppings so peppers and onions and four different kinds of uh, olives and um, I thought of your wife, it's like me, mm -hmm. she would have been fighting me for the olives. And then I look over at the table next to it, which again, isn't much of a table, but there's a can of, of sardines opened. There's freshly made uh, a garlic croutons. There was a bowl of, of bacon <laughs> yep. and cheeses and all this stuff for a simple little salad bar. It was an amazing salad bar and of course first thing they have you do is to clean your hands and you know give you the mm -hmm. rules of how you're supposed to handle food you had to wear a mask if you leave your table and so on steak shows up so you uh you have a picture there of the steak and you got a picture of the guy cooking the steaks um you bring up either one of those oh which one do you want first either either one of those all right what's well, the one that looks good to me uh, raw so steaks. That's the view from the front door. You walk in, front counters on your right, and directly in front of you is this guy cooking. All those steaks that are sitting there are the ones he's taken orders for at a table. So the butcher board with all the with, with the big loin is is behind the counter there, and look, he he's even has a ruler there if somebody wants to, <laughs> to measure how much their steak is. Mm. Uh, and so that guy's there cooking away. And then the next picture that you have is my, uh, and I only got 12 ounces. I didn't go crazy and, and low, low lighting, but look at those, look at those sear marks that he didn't, he, he turned it over, but he didn't move it once it hit the, hit the grill. Mm -hmm. uh, just absolutely perfect, medium rare. Uh, I've watched a couple of videos on YouTube. I went and searched this just to see if they ever do anything. No, ribeye's their thing. And the guy behind the counter there who cooked is the guy who is in all the YouTube videos. I don't know if he's an owner or manager or head chef or what. Yeah. He kind of walks you through the whole process. 
It was so good. I will take you there someday. But okay. um, also, we had no idea what we were spending until the bill came because we had no menu. <laughs> yeah, it was uh, it was not an inexpensive meal, but boy, was it good. It was not inexpensive. It was not inexpensive. No. Yeah, I have uh, only only one time have I have I eaten in a place a steakhouse where they ask you to uh, this particular place they ask you to get up and go over to the butcher area and choose what you wanted um, you know tell them how much and and it was like going to a, a like going to a butcher counter at a grocery mm-hmm. store and so they've got the uh, whole selection and you tell them you know I want one one link of this and you know five ounces of that and uh, that was that was quite an experience. Was that in Texas or where were you? No, um, I have, well, I, well, I take it back. I, Texas doesn't count um, because Texas is barbecue. <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, steakhouse, right? So I've never not done that at a steakhouse in Texas. Um, that was in uh, the UK, it was in the UK. And so it was an old farm style, um, <laughs> aged, aged steak house. Uh, it was delicious. Um, everything I had there was delicious. Um, except that we started off with a um, selection of aged cheeses. I would have to look at pictures to find out which uh, cheese it was, but one of the the aged cheeses, most of them were delicious. One of them, um, the only, it, it, it tasted like a dirty diaper. It, oh. it, it, it had, I mean, top to bottom, it was it was vile. It really was was nasty. Um, it, uh, it it smelled like those um, uh, like a, a diaper like with those crystals when they get wet that weird smell that they have oh premium more of a premium diaper yeah yeah it was um, it was that was disappointing all of the other cheeses were delicious and and you know they they all came with all of them came with warnings that hey this is a little funky I, I don't remember exactly which one it was we took pictures of it and everything um, I mean it was one where where uh, it, the second bite was a dare. Because after the first bite, everyone decided. <laughs> you know what you're in for. <laughs> yeah, we're done. This is oh boy. Um, and then uh, we tried to go back. Maybe, maybe, maybe if you like let it linger or chew it differently or something. But no, there was no winning with that. But yeah, it was a fancy place. I went. I was traveling with a guy in Texas. Um, he's out of Louisiana, so we were somewhere along the east coast of Texas, and I want to say it was like Nacogdoches. Na- na- um, I'm not pronouncing it right. Anyway, um, and he says, so what, what, are you, what are you hungry for for lunch? I said, well, I'm, I'm eating low carb. So wherever we go, it's kind of needs to be meat, meat centric. He goes, got just the place. We pull into a, a, a real simple, simple place that was basically a steakhouse. Their specialty at lunch was like a 16 ounce ribeye. And just like half the places in Texas, they serve it just bare on a piece of butcher paper. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and again, Nancy. it was just perfect. I would go back there in a heartbeat. It was so good. And probably a fraction of what we paid the other night. Oh, really? Yeah, in Texas, the cows are just dying. They're just falling over it's left and right. So, so they have to cheap. Eat them. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it is so cheap. Um, yeah, that, uh, that place, I also had a, uh, Scottish egg for the first time. Oh, that was good. That's something. Yep. So I um, think I sent you one more picture. Uh, we, we drove on down to Lafayette and I'm sitting in a traffic light. We're on our way to get pho for lunch that this is the day after. So I'm looking for something light. If you don't know, pho is a Vietnamese soup. And I'm sitting there at the light, and at this cemetery, I see this sign. And they're having a buy one, get one free. <laughs> and I cool. thought, okay, somebody's joking. Somebody just put that out there. But no, nope, that line right above there says Lafayette Memorial Park, BOGO. <laughs> wow. I mean, you got to plan ahead, you know? Mm-hmm. Oh. Well, you know, Valentine's coming up. That's right. <laughs> Romance. Uh, so anyway, it uh, the the a guy that I was doing some training with today, 
was with me when we went to Germany and Switzerland two years ago. Yeah. And we were reminiscing because the two of us were the ones that ordered the horse steak in Switzerland. Everybody else was a scared too. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, uh, I'll share this because it's relevant. Um, I just found a video of my coworker um, eating that cheese. <laughs> So uh, let's mm. share this. Oh, oh wait, that, wait, wait, wait. Was, was that the first taste or the second? Hang on, hang on. Am I sharing audio? Not yet. Hold on. Now you're not sharing anything. No, uh, no, I understand. Yep, uh, share audio. I always forget to click that. Yeah. Uh, I think, I don't know. I think this may have been the second Feed. taste where I insisted I need to catch this on video. I never thought I could hate a cheese. I was certain I couldn't. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Here's that back end. Just right. Des describe the flavor. It's the back end. It's the back end. It's the back end of the cheese. It's the back end cheese. <laughs> <laughs> One of these cheeses is not like the other. Oh, God, it's all coming out my nose. <laughs> Oh, it's nose cheese now? Oh, no. Oh, oh. That's how I smell. <laughs> Why do we get the feeling that video is going all over the internet? Oh, it's not the first. Oh. He does one of me dancing in my office. They turn into a... Oh, man. Uh, yeah, it was, a, it was a mess. So, well, uh, uh, you bought into GameStop yet? No, I've not bought into GameStop. So let's talk about GameStop. Just for history, for somebody who <laughs> who may not know what, what went on this week in the world of GameStop. Um, I've learned so much about parts of the stock market in the last week. Uh, so what I, what I understand is that some hedge fund um, people uh, shorted GameStop stock um, over the last probably, I don't even know how long, six months to a year. And uh, what that means is they can borrow somebody's stock. So let's say you own $100 worth of stock. I'm going to borrow that and promise to repay you later. Um, with the borrowed stock, I then sell it today. So I have $100 in my pocket. And six months from now, my expectation is that that same $100 worth of stock will be $50. And so I will buy it back. I will give it back to you. Its value has now lowered and I get to, you have your stock, the same number of stocks. It's just the value is different and I get to pocket the difference. Yeah. And what has happened with GameStop is some savvy people online noticed that um, GameStop, uh, the hedge fund people. GameStop. Yes. Um, hedge fund people did this to the tune of 140% of the available stock. So they shorted it and then they shorted it again and they did it again and they did it again to where the only way that they could make money back is if it got down to $4. And, and so what's interesting is um, there have been some cases where this is a really good thing where mm -hmm. um, Enron, for example, uh, when the, sh the stock is shorted, um, the expectation is that this company is going to fail. And so the people that short the stock have a vested interest in that company failing. Correct. And one thing that that does is it brings about investigation into reasons why that, that business may not be worth the value it currently is on, on the stock market. Mm -hmm. um, but the dark side is it can also, it gives them an invested interest, interest in having this business that could be on the up and up totally fail. And yeah. so that's what happened with GameStop. Um, and so what people on the Wall Street bets subreddit discovered is that hey at some point in the future these these hedge funds are going to have to buy back 140 percent of the available stock for gamestop if we buy it up now and refuse to sell it to them the only way they can have any hope of buying it back to pay back you the person they borrowed it from because they're they're contracted to do that is um as if the price goes sky high. And so um, these people, as happens on the internet, they said, hey, here's an opportunity. Hey, here's an opportunity. Here's an opportunity. 
And so uh, it began with people seeing, hey, there's an opportunity to make some money. But then it has now become as, as there has been just absolute public outrage against these Redditors for trying to scam the system by doing yeah. something totally legal, totally- yeah, doing what um, other people do. Doing exactly, you know, it is only because these hedge funds were incredibly greedy and shorted the stock more than there is stock available to purchase. Um, that as a result of this, it's now become uh, half, let's seize this opportunity and half, let's stick it to Wall Street. Yeah. And so there's been, um, a, 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 the general attitude is screw those guys. And now it has snowballed to where other parts of the system are involved. For instance, um, just about every news article is painting these Reddit people in a terrible, terrible light mm -hmm. unreasonably to make them the enemy. They have done nothing wrong in this. Um, and yet they are being painted as these just terrible people that, that uh, you know, some of whom voted for Trump and some of whom, um, you know, have blah, blah, blah. Uh, their numbers grew from 2 million to 4.5 million in a week on the Wall Street Bet subreddit. Um, the other thing is a lot of the, oh, in the, in the, the app that they were using, right? Philip that's Franco right. So, was, was touting that, uh, so uh, Robin hood, Robin hood and, yeah. and just about every other, um, uh, small, um, individual user, um, day trader, day trader app, um, stopped, stopped accepting, uh, purchases of, of the stock. They would only allow you to sell. You couldn't buy um, GameStop stock. You which, only... by the way, means <clears throat> that the price has got to go down. That's the only that, place that... for it to go. If you can't yeah, buy you it, can... no one can buy it. You can only right. sell it. If anybody yeah. sells it, the price goes down. Um, and so there's this big uh, uh, class action lawsuit. The SEC is involved. You know, when, when AOC and Ted Cruz agree on something, you, you have done messed up. And so there is this big ordeal um now there's there and, and it's still ongoing uh, it's still ongoing um what this this situation causes is what they call a short squeeze where um as long as the day traders refuse to sell and these hedge fund people are required to purchase the there is a going to be a point in time where the uh the the um demand becomes astronomically high for a limited supply. And so the stock has no place to go but up. Um, uh, and then there's similar situation with AMC. It's been the other big one in the news. There are a couple others that are really close that are 70 to 80% um, shorted. Uh, you know, I think AMC is the only other one I know of that's over 100% shorted. Um, the others are, are, are close to that, but will cause similar situations. And so now you've got all of these day traders, all these people that have come together on on Reddit, and they're they're angry. They're angry with how they've been painted. They're angry with with uh, the system that is is clearly um, has clearly been designed to keep them down and is showing its true colors. You know, um, every interview, <laughs> every interview with with uh, these Wall Street guys is just continuing to um, paint a "woe is me." kind of picture where, um, you know, they're the victim somehow that uh, all of these, uh, all of these citizens have come together to take them out. Um, it's their system. They built it. Yep. Yep. So um, this will date this back when we were living on Morris farm. So uh, at least what say 19 years ago could have been 20 or 21 years ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, I heard a commercial on some radio program of this guy talking about how it's possible to make money even when a stock goes down and they will send you free information. And they sent me a cassette tape that explained this whole process. And it's mm -hmm. like, gosh, that's really weird. I mm -hmm. never knew that, that you can, you can make money on a stock if it goes down. Yeah. That, that's exactly what they were espousing. Yeah, like I said, I, I don't own any stock other than 401k stuff. I don't pay any attention to that. And, yeah. But because it's been totally unavoidable, every single channel that I watch, 
on on YouTube has talked about it, has brought it up because it's been such a big deal. Um, Reddit has, I can't see anything on Reddit but that. If you search by popular, it's you know every every other or four out of every five posts is something from Wall Street Bet. But you have purchased things at GameStop, so you do have a, an interest. I, I have purchased things from GameStop. Well, and that's the other thing is, you know, a lot of the articles are, um, uh, if, you, if you are interested in learning more about this, I highly, highly, highly recommend checking out Luis Roosman. Probably just butchered his name, I apologize. Um, he is a MacBook repair person in New York City, and he is has over the last years has become the, the face of right to repair. Um, the idea oh, that yeah. uh, you have, you should have the right to repair items that you have purchased. And um, a lot of the big companies, Apple is the primary, um, but some of these big companies uh, make it impossible to repair your own goods. Um, one of the ones uh, that Apple did. Um, was uh, you can't, if you replace the camera in a current generation iPhone, the software will not start up again. It, it bricks your phone because you have to take it to an Apple repair technician for them to basically unlock it. And so you cannot, as the owner of that phone, which um, your terms of service contract and stuff is ridiculous because technically you don't own your phone, you are leasing your phone. Even if you pay for it outright, it's it's technology that's owned, uh, it's leased to you as is the software. Um, and because you don't own it, you can't repair it. And if you try to repair it, it may become inoperable. And right. so he's the face of this. Well, he has been doing just some phenomenal breakdowns of this. And what I really appreciate about his point of view is, is that he's just very reasonable, very logical in his approach. He is very fast to give credit with uh, people that he disagrees with. You know, some of his, his great videos are talking about things that Apple has done. Uh, this week, Facebook came out attacking Apple because uh, according to, to Zuckerberg, um, Facebook is, is uh, uh, Apple is Apple Facebook. Came, and then Apple, uh, Tim Cook came out and said some stuff without naming Facebook. I didn't see that. Oh my gosh, without naming Facebook, he, he basically went on to talk about uh, he even said the words social dilemma in mm. his statement, right? He talked about these companies who you are the product. That's right. You know, all your information. Yeah. And, That's right. um, you know, according to, according to this guy, uh, Facebook is totally in the wrong here. They're trying to, um, at what Apple has done is they've implemented privacy policies that are actually, actually managing privacy. And Facebook doesn't like that. He gave an example. I've not watched the uh, Social Dilemma movie yet, but he, mm -hmm. he gave an example from a number of years ago when Facebook apparently was showing a certain portion of a user's um, negative and like depressed uh, posts and was showing the other, other section uh, positive posts and was um, using that to measure their behavior and see if their posts would uh, mimic positive or negative um, posting. And sure enough, yeah, if you're if you're looking at negative things, your posts become more negative, looking at positive things, they become more positive. They have total control over what you see. They have total and absolute control over what you see. And it is not a surprise um, with the, some of the behavioral psychology stuff that we, we have studied um, over the last year. It's not at all a surprise to find out that they are manipulating users um, to gather all sorts of information, all sorts. Yeah. Uh, I, I enjoyed the social dilemma. It was, um, there were, there's some kind of hokey, they're not even reenactments. They were just trying to convey the message of what's going on in your brain mm. and, and how it, how it needs this content as it's being fed. And so instead of using cartoon characters, like in the, the Disney movie, what's the one with the emotions? Um, uh, yep. I can't remember. Oh, I'm thinking of soul, but that's not it. No, no, that's a new one. Anyway, um, but they use the they use the actor who played uh, Pete Campbell on Mad Men. I know, don't think you were a Mad Men fan. Uh, Mad Men fan. It was kind of weird, and those elements I didn't need. That my brain, my own brain, can tell me how to take in the content, right? So they right. they would they would talk in, in real. Um, um, you know, they're, they're talking to people that used to work for Apple or who used to work for Google or who used to work for Facebook. 
and they talk about how you know the this information is being used and shared and so on and in, in kind of documentary style and then they would go into these little um Re-enacted vignettes it. which right. like i say yeah but i liked it i mean uh, overall the the show what say it's two hours long and there was 20 minutes that i thought was kind of stupid but yeah. it's it's scary enough if you're not paying attention if you're not aware that you are the product and that like you say what they're showing you is what they're cho- choosing to expose you to i started noticing wait a second i don't ever see any posts from one of my sisters is she not on facebook i go in and i dig in a little bit and see no she is posting but because I hadn't liked it enough or hadn't That's commented right. on her post enough, they decided she was insignificant to me and yep. that they, they weren't going to show that to me. In the meantime, they're doubling up the number of ads they're showing me. Yeah. You know, and suggested posts. So, I mean, yeah, you know, one, one place uh, it's worth pointing out that YouTube is no different. Oh, um, yeah. I mean, almost none of the time am I deciding what to watch on YouTube? Almost 0% of the time do I make the decision what to watch. YouTube does. YouTube decides what I'm watching. Um, so do you start just, at your homepage or do you look at your subscriptions first? Oh, uh, I don't know. I don't have either. I, I'm, on, I'm on mobile. So I'm on uh, whatever the main, I, I, there are only two tabs on, on mobile really. Home, Let's see which and one? Subscription. Home, home. Uh, nope. I don't ever, ever one time look at subscriptions. I look at yeah. Home. So you are it's seeing cool. what they're offering you, and that's and that is based on what you watch. It's based on the algorithm. And okay, you, we were just talking about how. But half of the are, stuff I just went to the subscriptions tab. The first two things are not are not channels I'm subscribed to. So what good is, is that, that possible to me? <laughs> are those ads the first two? Uh, it's not clear that they're ads. This is somebody I'm not subscribed to. This right, is go. a keto thing. I'm not subscribed to them. I'm not subscribed uh, to them. Yeah, my first two I'm subscribed to. Third, fourth. I don't think yeah, I'm subscribed are, to these, these are channels. These are channels I'm subscribed to on the subscription yeah, feed. I'm totally And then not what's it, it's interesting on the home page is they present to you a mix. It's some that you're subscribed right. to, but maybe that you missed over the last week. Not subscribed and others to this. that are are similar to the ones that you've watched. You know what what I found interesting is I have four different Instagram feeds. Not subscribed to Netflix, but they're on my subscriptions. Hmm. I I have four different Instagram feeds. And when I go to the, I think it's called Explore tab, what it offers up to me as other things that are posted that I might like are vastly different. Now. One of them is is my Arista Grub, so that's food related. Arista right. Cobb is is smoking related. The My Growth Rings is woodworking related. So, I would I would see some pattern to that, but then some of the things just don't make any sense. And what I found out was they feed you stuff based on the people that you are subscribed to and who they subscribe to. Hmm. And so, you know, on the the food related ones, there are far more women channels that are concerned about diet and things like that. So they're feeding me stuff about Pilates and, Mm -hmm. you know, yoga and all that stuff and the woodworking things is it it's it was surprising to me the 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 difference between the contents that they're they're offering. And And I mean, stuff that I would never subscribe to. But apparently yeah. it's based on the people that follow this are also into those things. Right. Yeah. What the, what they're doing is they're saying people like you <laughs> also like things. Yeah. Now yeah, you're going to make me sneeze. Hold on a second. I got to mute myself. Come on, unmute them. I can do that. I'm the moderator. Here it comes. It's fine. I'll unmute myself then. No, nope, I'm going to mute you now. See, you muted him. Don't forget to unmute yourself when you're done. <laughs> Whatever. Um, uh, sitting here long enough, I had to swap my and charge my earbuds. Oh, really? Well, yeah. 
I got my Speaking new iPad in, so I, I just oh, noticed right. that a half hour before we were meeting here was that my iPad was sitting on the front porch. Ooh. So I'm uh, currently getting that. That was actually an interesting process. I've never done that where you can instantly transfer from your previous device to your new device with basically mm -hmm. a QR code. And it just, it, it's in the process of downloading mm -hmm. everything from the cloud. Right. Uh, there was somebody posted um, to a uh, Facebook group for our neighborhood. Um, some a video of somebody taking a package off their porch. Ooh. And uh, uh, we recognized that the, the house from the um, from the video, they, they posted the video uh, from a ring. We recognize the house. It's just someone just a couple doors down the, the street across the street. Um, mm. We had a package delivered around the same time, and it was not taken. But so know, time for, for a time, time for a, a glitter bomb or a box yeah. of your dog's poop or something. Yeah. Well, I've I've thought for a while about putting a, one of my spare uh, cameras up out by the front door, and I guess it's time to go ahead and do that. So, um, but yeah, you will enjoy, you will enjoy the, uh, the iPad with the Apple Pencil. Um, I'll, I'll give you a couple of recommendations for some apps that I use all the time, all the time with that, um, for handwritten notes and stuff. I, I, I write a lot now, um, a lot more than I did before getting that, um, but never on paper. It's always on my iPad. Um, but I, I do a lot of handwritten stuff these days. So, I, I look forward to doing it. Um, you'll, re, you'll really dig it. Uh, also, I personally, um, just about 0% of the time do I ever use the uh, Apple Pencil uh, charging adapter. I'm almost always charging it at the bottom of the iPad. I, I know nothing about it. I haven't even opened the pencil yet. So, so I'll show you. So I've got mine here. Um, this this can plug in ah. there and charge it um and i only need to charge it i don't know once or twice a week um it, it doesn't battery lasts a very long time um just as you can tell this is a pretty precarious setup it would be yeah. very easy to drop this or, or or break it so just be extra careful when you're doing that but um i i don't ever I don't even know where the the charging it, it comes with a charging adapter. It's a two way adapter, two way female adapter that can plug this in. But okay, it useless. is a lightning male end on it. I got it. It is, yeah. So the adapter you can plug your lightning cable into that. Um, and those cases, the the newer cases seem to have a spot dedicated for putting the adapter though. So mine does oh, not. Okay. But anyway, you'll enjoy that. But uh, right. we have gone way longer than we intended to, um, okay. as happens. First time we've really kind of caught up in a while. So um, hopefully for next week, we'll be back in the shop. And, and we've got a summer. bunch of tobacco advent, tobacco overrun that we need to get to. Thanks again um, for those of you who we've not acknowledged. Um, I, I told Boy a week ago or so, I stopped by the post office and, and just on a lark thought, I would double check the P.O. box. Usually after tobacco advent, we don't get much in the P.O. box. And uh, I think we have like nine tobacco or nine packages. Ten. Yeah, I think we've got 10. So, man, you guys have come through. Thank you so much. And uh, as we mentioned before, there will be bonus ornaments being produced and ornaments. So we'll, we'll get those when we can get those. But uh, we really appreciate your support and uh, hope that you've enjoyed watching. Thank you if you stuck this long. And uh, good to see you, boy. We'll get back together and do that soon. Hope you get to feel it well. Thank you. And uh, the rest of you, make it a great week. Thanks. See ya.